Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambeau channel. We here in the XRP community have a high level of confidence, which I'd say is well justified, regarding the outcome of the SEC vs. Ripple case, right? We, we in the weeds, following this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, we can see that the SEC's argument is weak, they are not on the right side of history, they are unethical asshats, whereas on the flip side you've got Ripple, who has been doing its best and has succeeded in operating in broad daylight, full transparency, or as close to it as is reasonably possible for the better part of a decade. And and so, I, you know, outside of the SEC, it's, it's hard to find people that think the SEC is in the right, and it's even harder to find people that think the SEC is actually going to have some sort of stunning victory, although they technically could. It's not outside the realm of possibility. I just personally, and I'm willing to bet that you're on the same page here, it just We just don't think it seems probable, right? Which is why we get uh, headlines like this. Here's an article from Tech Story. Uh, the title is, Experts predict Ripple will win the SEC case, which could see a rise in the XRP price. And by the way, uh, to me that seems highly likely. If, if this goes the way we think and hope it will, I, I, I anticipate that pretty much immediately the price of XRP is going to rocket regardless of what whatever else is happening in crypto in the moment. And and I still don't think that generally news impacts the price of uh, XRP or Bitcoin or pick your cryptocurrency. That's generally not the case. It's more like things happen, uh, crypto is volatile, and then whatever is happening in the moment, uh, that's attributed to people, uh, people will attribute to whatever's happening in the moment to that price action. But I, I just, I'm not convinced that that's actually what's causing all this. The whole market's moving in tandem. It's pretty clear people are not sufficiently considering fundamentals when it comes to the price action of this stuff. But for something like this, uh, th there's historical precedent for this. In fact, if you go back and look at the uh, end of the Kick Interactive case, what happened when Kick Interactive's Kin token got clarity? Well, it started rocketing in terms of price action right away and ended up going up over 2,000%. And so there's precedent for something like this. If we, if we get the, the news that we think and hope is coming, it's probably going to be pretty damn wild right here. That, that, that is what I would anticipate would happen. And, and there's no way to, to know for sure, uh, but, but I, I do suspect that that's what's coming. And look, I do want to be clear too, I don't have a legal or financial background of any kind. I'm not offering legal or financial advice, and you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who likes making uh, YouTube videos about crypto-related topics, but purely as a hobby, just for fun. Uh, but still, ha happy to be transparent and share my opinion. Yes, I do anticipate that you're going to see the price rocket. And and the, kind of the, one of the cooler things about this is, if there's going to be a settlement surrounding this, like we won't even know that it's coming in all likelihood. There, there, there's almost a 0% chance we'd know it's coming. It, the news would just break, and you'd wake up one day, and then XRP would just be like psh, chugging along. That that's, that's what I would anticipate. It would be way up in terms of price action, and we wouldn't have to worry about this, this clarity anymore surrounding the space either. And so I want to share with you, there's this interview from um, uh, the, the Business of Business. And they interviewed attorney John Deaton, who, of course, is the attorney seeking to intervene in the SEC versus Ripple case on behalf of over 20,000 XRP holders now. And so I actually, uh, if you can hear this, he's got some dead trees up in my hand here. I actually printed this up. And what I, what I want to do is highlight uh, the, some of the portions of this interview that I found most interesting, including... Uh, and I'll start with, like, because John Deaton, I just think it's fascinating how he, he talks about how he actually got into this whole case in the first place. Uh, but ultimately, he's asked, he's like, okay, so what if Ripple actually loses? Like, what does that mean? And so he gets into some detail about that. Uh, but also on the flip side, what happens if the SEC loses? And that's the more interesting question, and he lays that out as well. So uh, let's go ahead and dig in. Let me jump into this. So the, f the first thing that was asked here, uh, this is from uh, the Business of Business, and this was uh, with interviewer Christy Smith. So Christy said, uh, so what I wanted to ask you, first of all, is we've been observing what it looks like, this big drama between the regulators and crypto entrepreneurs, crypto investors, and you play a really interesting role in that ongoing drama both in terms of your general sort of job and also as with respect to the Ripple case. Can you talk a little bit about that? And John Deaton says the following. Uh, what started off uh, is, is with me. I got into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies just as an individual interested person. 
XRP, Bitcoin, Ethereum were primarily my investments. And then I learned of the Ripple case. I'm not a securities lawyer by training or education or practice. But when I read that complaint, I knew that it made absolutely no sense, legally speaking, the way the SEC was approaching it. The way it went down by being filed on the last day of former Chairman Jay Clayton's tenure at the SEC. Just there were too many questions. And so I realized that what was going to happen would be delistings and suspensions of XRP. And market cap was going to be wiped out. And I got upset that people's lives were being impacted because of politics. And so I filed a writ of mandamus on behalf of myself and several people I know in Rhode Island federal court seeking to order the SEC to limit the charges to the uh, only the claims that it can actually prove. And so that's how this started. Yeah, and by the way, if I could just pause here, they never wanted to do it. And, you know, basically, think about this, too. And John Deaton said this in the past. If the SEC would just acknowledge that today's XRP is not in and of itself a security just by existing, then they could just, like, get them off their back. They won't do it. They won't just come out right and say They won't. Not, and so, like, I mean, they'll verbally state it, which is a lie, but then you go back into their legal arguments, and they are arguing that today's XRP absolutely is a security. I've highlighted that many times on this Moon Mambo channel with a silly-ass name. Uh, they're absolutely still arguing that, even though if you ask them, they'll say they're not, but then you go to the legal argument, and they are, because they're asshats. That's the reason. And, and it's just, the, so if they wanted them off their back, they actually could make it happen. I think it's. I think that's pretty. I mean, John Deaton's made it pretty damn clear. Like that's the reason here. He's not here to be an advocate specifically for Ripple, uh, and and nor should he have to be. It's 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 about you know, arguing on behalf of the XRP holders. But anyway, then he continues. Uh, then of course, what this turned out to be is it started as an individual person with a few friends who sort of wanted to take a stand, and then all of a sudden there were thousands. Tens of thousands, actually now up to 20,000 people uh, who have joined in our fight against the SEC. It's not about Ripple for us, you know. Ripple has an impressive legal team, and they can defend their actions. I don't defend Ripple. I don't take a position on what their business model is or any transactions they made. The position I'm taking is that the SEC has made claims that it doesn't have a good faith basis to make, quite frankly, and it is inconsistent with 75 years of securities laws. And so that's how I got involved. And then Christie states the following. Right, okay. So to recap real quickly, the SEC sued Ripple, alleging that XRP was an unregistered security. And this is all in the guise of protecting investors. And you are representing something like 20,000 holders of XRP who are saying, hey, wait, I'm not being defrauded. I want to have a say here. Is that about right? And then John Deaton continues. That's right. See, because the SEC did something that they normally never do. Normally, when they sue a company, they'll say that the specific sales you, that you made at these particular occasions, that those were unregistered securities. In this case, the, the SEC said that all XRP, including today's XRP that is traded in the secondary market and from people who have no connection to Ripple, that those are securities. And so that's the real unique distinction that separates this case from others. And then Christie says the following. And it seems like after the Ripple case, now with the disclosure of the Coinbase investigation and just in general, I've noticed a lot of chatter. There's more chatter that's kind of more confrontational about crypto, just kind of out of out there on Twitter. I've noticed journalists who don't normally cover crypto suddenly taking sides. What do you attribute this rise of interest in regulating crypto to? And John Deaton says the following. Uh, it comes to the money. Listen, today I don't know exactly the number, but you got to understand there is a big difference between a $200 billion total asset class versus today, it's almost $2.5 trillion. You have Bitcoin being projected to replace the market cap of gold or equal the market cap of gold. That's a $10 trillion asset. You have El Salvador listing Bitcoin as legal tender in its country. And so basically it has developed into what is projected to be tens of trillions of dollars in market cap. 
I think that's in essence one of the big reasons that it came uh, came down. And you have what is called a jurisdictional grab, right? You have the SEC and Gary Ginzer saying, hey, you know, these are securities. Even though he's on record when he was a professor at MIT saying they were more like commodities. But he's now the chairman of the SEC and they want their regulatory hands right in the middle of all of that. That's what's going on. You've got this asset class that's not going away. It's not a fad. And it's ballooning and ballooning. It's gotten the attention of the regulators. And I think that's the common lay person's answer, if you will. It's, it's getting bigger. It's just getting bigger and bigger. I mean, you have some of the greatest investors in the world, like ARK's Kathy Wood, you know, just, uh, just at the SALT conference saying that a conservative projection of Bitcoin within the next four or five years is half a million dollars per Bitcoin. Raul Paul, you know, a former Goldman Sachs hedge fund manager, is predicting Ethereum is going to $20,000 or $30,000 per Ethereum. Uh, and, and so if, if those things happen... The market goes from $2.3 trillion today to, you know, $50 trillion, $40 trillion, $30 trillion, whatever it is going to be, you can't ignore it when it grows to this extent. By the way, and if I could just pause, uh, that's something that I've been saying since the bottom of this bear market when you had roughly a $175, uh, $175 billion market cap for the entire asset class. We go to like, you know, say mid-December of 2018. Uh, it was clear even then that we were still in an upward trend the fight, despite the fact that we're in the moment we're in a, a deep valley, you know, being a bear market. But I, I've been saying the same thing for years and I firmly believe it. Even though most of these cryptocurrencies that exist, I think, will ultimately go away because they don't do anything and they won't all be adopted. It's just, you know, kind of messy getting towards the maturation portion of this asset class. But, but d just despite that, I, I said before it ever happened, I said you're eventually one day going to have a trillion dollar market cap. And I said, eventually, you'll have a multi-trillion dollar market cap. Now, both of those things have come to pass, but eventually, it is going to get into the tens of trillions. Why not over 100 trillion with how big this is? I mean, there are definitely going to be individual cryptocurrencies that do have multi-trillion dollar, uh, multi dollar market caps. And so, Attorney John Deaton, he's hitting the nail on the head here. And so, of course, you're seeing all of these big names and the SEC and every regulator under the sun creeping out. Uh, to try and just to, to take control. They want their piece of the regulatory pie. And the SEC is is going in for a larger share that is theirs, if they even deserve a share. And and they probably do. I'm just I'm just saying like they seem the most power hungry part of the uh, the federal government when it comes to crypto related stuff in the US, I would say. That that's my opinion at this point anyway. Anyway, and then Christy says uh, do you think the S that SEC chairman Ginzer has a point when he says that there are there needs to be a bigger regulatory framework or some kind of regulatory framework to put around this because it's like the wild west and then john says the following i think it's fair to say that we need regulations that doesn't mean we need more regulations it doesn't mean we need bigger regulations uh, what was needed are the right regulations and we need the right jurisdictional body and so when you have the wild west i would agree with them it's the Wild West, but from a different perspective. It's where all of these agencies are getting involved. Is the U.S. Treasury, uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the SEC, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. I mean, you have multiple government agencies that are getting involved here. Look at the Ripple case. In 2015, Ripple was fined $700,000 for violating banking laws, uh, the banking secrecy laws, right? And so they entered into a settlement agreement with FinCEN and the Department of Justice that they would register all future sales of XRP with FinCEN. But of course, there's that one line in the agreement that says, this does not mean that you don't have to comply with other regulatory agencies or securities laws. So now you basically have a token that was deemed a convertible virtual currency in 2015 and in 2020, it's being called a security. That's the kind of clarity we need. Obviously, it makes sense if you're trying to apply the famous test when it comes to what's an investment contract with the company, the Howey test. You know, it's probably never been talked about so much as it has in the last several years. It's, a difficult, uh, it's difficult to take a case that came down from the U.S. Supreme Court in 1946 
and apply it to modern day blockchain technology. There's no doubt the right answer is Congress. Congress needs to step in and make clear which governmental agency is going to be the proper one to exercise oversight and provide guidance to market participants because we're at a crossroads. Ah, oh, man, he, guys, let me pause there. John Deaton, again, hitting the nail on the head. <clears throat> this is something that I've also been saying for the longest time. It, it's, you know, it's Congress that ultimately decides what part of the United States federal government is in charge of what. So when it comes to uh, is cryptocurrency specifically, uh, Congress gets to decide, period. Uh, and so how, how can how can people have within the crypto and blockchain space have a positive impact on that? Well, the answer is lobbying. Like it or not, the answer is lobbying. And Ripple, the company, is the largest uh, entity in the United States uh, in terms of lobbying. They actually are. And, and, and they still barely put any money in the scheme of things. The last full calendar year, they put in, I think, less than $700,000 themselves. And, and and just for perspective, I mean, maybe that sounds like a big number, but I'm just saying in the scheme of things, it absolutely actually is not. And that's not a dig against Ripple. I'm glad they've done what they've done. But the whole space is, that's what I'm saying. The whole space needs to jump in and, and, and engage in lobbying efforts to impact Congress to determine who's in charge of what. That's what I'm talking about, because otherwise you're just going to have regulation through enforcement, and it's not going to be a fun time. But anyway, John Deaton continues. Ethereum went overseas to develop their technology because they were worried about securities laws. They ended up getting a pass in 2018, but you have these technologies that are not setting up their headquarters in the United States because of this lack of clarity. I always hesitate when someone says, do we need more, bigger types of regulations? No, we just need the right type of regulations. There's always going to be bad players, right? I think the SEC does have a role when you have these pump and dump schemes or you have a fraudulent actor out there, but right now, what they're doing, listen, we have Coinbase that the SEC is going after, and we have state agencies going after BlockFi, and we just learned yesterday that the state is going after Celsius. And why? How are they protecting investors? They're protecting me and you from getting 4% interest on our assets when the bank gives us, what, at this point, 0.0005%? How is, how is it that I can put my money in a bank account and the bank can pull all of the funds of its other customers and pay me a very slight little bit of interest and there's no issue? But if I purchase my Bitcoin or my XRP or my Ether and I loan it out to Coinbase and then they lend it out and give me 4% interest, how is that different? Oh my God, I love that. This is exactly the point that I've been making. It isn't different unless the SEC wants to argue that it's different. They're arguing it's different, but it isn't. They're saying, but basically, I think this is what they'll say when they actually find out, finally come out and make their point, assuming there's a lawsuit here between Coinbase and them. They'd end up arguing that, uh, that the... Uh, the interest-bearing accounts where you're earning your 4% interest or whatever the hell it ends up being, that the, the putting the money into that in the first place represents a fund. And they're going to say that's functionally different than a savings account. But it's not functionally different. They're just using uh, you know, word salad to, to make it into something that it also... Like, they're just verbally stating it. It doesn't mean it is different because it's not. But that's what they're arguing. It's just, it's about protecting the incumbents, as, as John Deaton has pointed out before. I think he's absolutely nailing it. Uh, let me jump a little bit ahead. Here's another part I wanted to talk about. We're getting to oh, my favorite part very soon, by the way, which is what happens uh, if Ripple wins or if the SEC wins. Um, so here we are. Okay, so here's another question. There is still a lot of criticism surrounding crypto. Things like that it's, you know, it's extremely risky, that you don't know what's going to happen, uh, that you can lose all your money that you can't spend it on anything. What do you say to those critics? And here's what John had to say in response to that. Well, first of all, I'd say that's not true. You have debit cards that tell you where you can use your crypto. PayPal is allowing you to spend your crypto as a substitute for fiat. But I'd ask those critics and those people if you ever heard of a company called Amazon, if they ever heard of a company called Google. Those companies were extremely risky companies in their first 10 years. Uh, Bitcoin is, what, 12 years old? And these other cryptos are a decade, maybe? And so this industry, this asset class, is literally in its first inning, if you will, if we're in a nine-inning baseball game. And so if you look at the volatility of Bitcoin, absolutely, it's a volatile asset, and people need to know that. 
and it has had literally 60%, 70%, 80% market cap declines in rapid moments. So yes, it's volatile. But so are equities. All right, he's talking about the volatility of equities markets. Isn't that true? Yeah. It says, uh, is GameStop, it was that volatile when it was going up and down? I mean, we have AMC movie theaters. Is that a volatile stock? And so I think the volatility argument and the speculation argument, I think, are the weakest of all arguments. Let me pause there to say, yes, absolutely, that is correct. And in fact, volatility is the point of investing. So when, when, when these people come out and say, oh, the volatility, it's just, no, it's not what we want. I'm just like... No, that is the point of investing. You're absolutely 100% incorrect when you say something as stupid as that. Anybody that says that, the volatility is a negative? No, that's a positive. That's why I'm here. Damn it. This is why we can't have nice things, folks. <laughs> uh, and then she says, uh, back to the Ripple case for a second. What happens if the SEC wins? We're not saying that it will, but what happens uh, to, to Ripple? What happens to XRP? And here's what John Deaton had to say about that. Well, I guess the question is, what is a win? If they win outright of what they've alleged in the complaint, then that means that all XRP would be deemed a security. In, and in essence, Ripple would only be able to sell it, uh, sell it after registering it and sell it to accredited investors where they have certain more specific requirements. Uh, they're also seeking $1.3 billion. And so if they received some type of verdict, uh, there probably would be a fund that XRP holders could get reimbursed to a certain extent. That doesn't mean Ripple's out of business. It would certainly transform their business and limit them in many ways. Yeah, so, it, okay, let me pop, talk here for a minute. Yeah, it would limit them, but I will say this also. Ripple's never sold to the end user, and so they're only selling to like big entities, strategic partners, and they better all qualify as accredited investors. They damn well better, and you know they would, right? Because they're not selling to the, the, the you know the individual person like you and me here, so that part of it wouldn't change. But the way in which uh, funds are being dispersed, that could be impacted, or maybe they wouldn't be allowed to disperse funds anymore, uh, and that would take them out of business probably more or less permanently in the United States. Maybe they could still function uh, just with RippleNet, but in terms of on-demand liquidity, any corridor that touches the United States, uh, that wouldn't be allowed to exist. It would just exist everywhere else on the planet, and then any corridor touching the United States would get slow transactions, and every other corridor were. Uh, on-demand liquidity and XRP are being adopted as a bridge would get fast transactions as long as there's sufficient liquidity and you know adoption of course which isn't a guarantee but I mean obviously I'm optimistic for that use case but uh, but yeah that's that's kind of what that would look like right now um, and then so the question is would that set bad precedent that's what Christy asks and he says oh great question absolutely it would be extremely bad because the SEC Everyone needs to understand this isn't like a new cryptocurrency where they've offered a fundraising event and they're going to develop the blockchain technology. That's an ICO, and that case law is well settled. This is the SEC going back seven and a half years retroactive. It's insane that from 2013 until, uh, un until the present day, all the sales of XRP were unregistered securities. That precedent uh, could have impact on literally 10,000 cryptos. I'd say that there's a couple hundred of them that are interesting and the rest of them are garbage, but it would have an absolute detrimental impact. I could name you 10 cryptocurrencies uh, off top of my head that would then be like potentially out of business as well. And so what's interesting is that since this Coinbase news and the attacks on decentralized finance and on BlockFi and Celsius, some of Ripple's biggest uh, cr uh, criticisms actually have, uh, critics have acknowledged that they've, uh, they're rooting for Ripple uh, because of the precedent that could be established. I don't see that happening. I think that the case is ripe for a settlement where Ripple agrees that early transactions in 2013 to 2017 were securities offerings uh, when there weren't hundreds of thousands of XRP holders and there was a much, much smaller ecosystem. That's where the SEC has potentially legitimate claims against Ripple. You would imagine that that's where a deal would be struck, where the ongoing future and present day sales are not deemed securities. But those earlier transactions were, and uh, Ripple pays a fine, and the market gets some clarity. Unfortunately, whoever the SEC goes after next will still have to fight that same fight. I think the more interesting question is, what happens if the SEC outli outright loses, right? And if that happens, if Ripple was successful, 
uh, for example, in their in their fair notice defense, and the SEC has an outright loss, uh, that has the hugest of implications. You know, if, if you look at Gary Gensler, going back to your question about his testimony, both in his testimony and his uh, letter to Elizabeth Warren, he actually says that the SEC has never lost a case, right? Like, he's almost boasting that, hey, we know what we're doing, and we never lose. And so the loss that the SEC would have and the implication on the industry is huge. I personally think that they'd be out of business as far as going after existing crypto ecosystems. If there is a new coin and it's not developed yet, they'll still have their jurisdiction. But if you're talking about all of the other cryptocurrencies that have been in existence for the last four, five, six, seven, eight years, I think the SEC would basically be out of business trying to regulate them. That's all. And so look, let me say this. That's that would be the dream scenario, wouldn't it? <laughs> Just the the uh, the SEC actually losing power as a result of going after Ripple, and it's up there. It, it's like they they're the ones that set themselves up for this. That would kind of be the dream outcome. I'm not so convinced that we're going to see that. I still tend to think that settlement's more likely. But even if we see full adjudication of this, I just I can't imagine a world uh, where where Ripple actually is put in a position where they can no longer operate in the United States having anything to do with XRP. Like I just I have a, and then and you're talking about what XRP can never be traded in the United States again. Is that really a future that seems uh, probable? I wouldn't say probable. I'm not going to say impossible, but I I just I don't think that's what's going to happen here. Um, I, I'm nothing but optimistic because it's, it's so crystal clear that Ripple is indeed on the right side of the law. So anyway, I found his takes to be fascinating. Uh, always fun topics to discuss here. But but yeah, as, as far as the experts predicting Ripple uh, Ripple will win against the SEC, yeah, that, that's certainly more probable than the, than the alternative. And you can imagine, again, what that means for the price of XRP. So again, I just imagine one day, I don't know when, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to see the news, it's going to be a price that jays this moment, and I'm going to go check the price of XRP, and it'll probably be taking off because that's going to happen instantly. Um, now, it doesn't mean it couldn't take a long time for it to really continue rocketing to, like, insane, insane levels, but I imagine that in initially we'd probably start to see some serious movement right away. But I'll go ahead and wrap up there. I am not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Lambeau.